What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. Now, today's episode, I feel, is long overdue. I'm surprised we have not already had this conversation. But on today's episode, I have the one and only Jeffrey Miller, who is a well-known evolutionary psychologist and a very interesting thinker out there in the world today. So welcome to the show, Jeffrey. How are you doing? Thanks. Great to be here, Zuby. Awesome. So I've done a brief intro there, Jeffrey, but for people who are not familiar with you and some of your work, please tell them a little bit about you. I've been involved in this field of evolutionary psychology for about 30 years, you know, ever since grad school at Stanford. And what we try to do is understand human nature and the origins of human preferences and desires, emotions, motivations, all the kind of architecture that makes us human. And we try to understand where does that come from? How does it work? How does it play out in modern life? So I've worked on a huge range of stuff like human intelligence, creativity, language, art, music, a lot on mating and mate choice and why we're attracted to certain things and other people, both males and females, particularly like uh, mental traits that are attractive, not just physical traits. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and more recently, I've gotten involved in things like the effective altruism movement, which is about how to do the most good that you can based on reason and evidence. I'm quite interested in global catastrophic risks that confront civilization and humanity. And I'm pretty active on Twitter as um, Primal Poly. Awesome. Well, there's so much that we can that we can get into on that. But before we dive right into it, Jeffrey, tell me a little bit more about your life story. Tell me more about everything that led up to this stage, because I'm sure there's an interesting story behind this all. Just grew up in a nice bourgeois family in Ohio. Um, went to Columbia University as an undergrad. Um, uh, Columbia, at least back in the 80s, was awesome because it was kind of like a great books, Western civilization. Uh, classical liberal education, but you could also take a lot of courses in, in diverse topics. And I was always fascinated by uh, both Western and Eastern civilization. Tried to study Japanese, took a lot of courses on, you know, history of um, China, Japan, India, etc. Um, went to grad school at Stanford, studied cognitive psychology, evolutionary psychology, spent nine years in England, actually, um, postdoc, Worked at University of Sussex, University College London, London School of Economics. Um, and since about 2001, I've been at University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, visited different other universities like NYU Stern Business School and sabbaticals here and there. Um, written uh, five books. Probably mm -hmm. the ones, you know, I'd strongly recommend most would be like The Mating Mind, my first book, Spent. Uh, from 2008 about consumer behavior. And then I did a little book called Virtue Signaling 2019 that's um, a little more political and mm -hmm. mostly focused on kind of free speech and um, why it's important. Awesome. What is it that got you interested in these areas to begin with to the point that you wanted to dedicate your life and career to going into them in such depth? Well, I'm kind of Aspie, you know, I've got a little touch of the Asperger's and like, I don't naturally understand people that well. Mm. And so there's like two kinds of people roughly who go into psychology. There's people who are like highly empathic and get people kind of naturally and want to help them. And then there's people like me who are like, what the hell is going on? I don't get <laughs> people. I particularly don't understand women. I need to be very systematic about mm. understanding them. So I shall study psychology. and. Um, that's what kind of got me into it um, as an undergraduate. And then I mm -hmm. thought, wow, the whole process of doing research and trying to systematically get a grip of, on, on human nature is just fascinating and rewarding. And I can't imagine anything uh, more fun in a way than doing evolutionary psychology, because anything you can imagine, anything that, that is of interest, there's kind of a psychology angle to it mm -hmm. somehow. So it's an extremely broad uh, field. It's very interdisciplinary. It's very exciting. We've made a lot of progress, I think, in the last 30 years. Mm. I think a lot of people mix up evolutionary psychology and evolutionary biology. So can you please explain the difference between them? I know I've had um, Gad Sad on my podcast twice yeah. before, who's an evolutionary biologist. He, well, he, am I, psychologist. Am I getting, psychologist. Yeah. Wait, am yeah. I getting this right? You're, you're both evolutionary psychologists. 
right? Rather than yeah. Modern. So I, all honestly, all we're trying okay. to do is a, apply all the amazing theory and tools and insights from evolutionary biology. Okay. To human psychology. Got it. Um, so like in graduate school, I read a huge amount about primate behavior, animal behavior, genetics, anthropology, mm -hmm. you know, the origins of people, studies of hunter gatherers and tribal people. And what you do is you try to weave that together in, in, into understanding modern human behavior. So in a sense, we're, we're more a branch of evolutionary biology than we are of kind of standard social sciences like you know, gender studies or sociology or Got cultural it. anthropology. So we take a very kind of hard sciences approach to psychology, um, but it's really informed by thinking humans are just another animal. We're very, you know, unusual, special, exciting kind of animal, but a lot of our behavior we share with other primates, other mammals, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And what was the first field within that area that really, that really grabbed you? What was the what was the first thing you went deep on? I went deep really on sexual selection theory. Okay. Back in grad school, circa 1989, right? Okay. I was absolutely fascinated by Darwin's key insight that, oh my God, we're not just shaped to survive, we're shaped to like please the preferences of the other sex. Mm -hmm. And in many species, that's basically males trying to to be the kind of males that females want. But in humans, it's mutual mate choice. Both sexes are choosy. Both sexes do courtship. Both sexes try to attract the other sex. So in us, it's a little more uh, balanced. And of course, the sexes like somewhat different things. They attach different weights to different traits. But the basic insight that a lot of what we are is there to attract the other sex, I found mm. extremely powerful. And I thought this can explain a lot about us um, our human intelligence, our language abilities, why we want to make art and music, why we want to rap, etc. <laughs> and um, I've gotten a lot of mileage out of that. And that's what my first book, The Mating Mind, was was really focused on. Yeah. What was the first uh, or what were some of the insights back then that shocked or surprised you? Because you said you came into this from a, to, to use your term, a slightly sort of Aspie perspective, um, who, uh, you know, a guy who's there trying to understand the opposite sex and, you know, perhaps trying to be more attractive to women and so on. So what were some of the, what were some of the core insights that made you go, oh, wow, that's, uh, that's something interesting that perhaps most people don't consciously think about or aren't even aware of? Well, one of my favorite topics is sense of humor. Why okay. why is sense of humor so um, attractive and important and, and valuable? And I've always been fascinated by stand-up comedy ever since the 80s. Mm -hmm. I've never done it, but I have like huge respect for comedians who are good at it. And um, that's one style of comedy. Often there's like sort of a, an you know extroverted alpha performing for a bunch of people. But in human courtship, in sort of intimate situations, often the best humor is like very, it's very ad hoc. It's kind of on the fly. It's not a pre-planned story. It's just like responding to the environment or ongoing social situations and saying something witty mm. and funny about it. Why is that attractive? It seems like a total like luxury ability that doesn't really help you survive. Like it humor doesn't help you find food or avoid predators or do a lot of other basic um, survival stuff. So what information is it conveying? Um, with my colleagues and grad students, we, we dove into this and, you know, basically um, intelligence is conveyed pretty well through sense of humor. And that's one reason I think sense of humor is attractive. It's kind of like an IQ indicator. It's also a mental health indicator because almost every uh, mental disorder you can think of, whether it's depression, anxiety, uh, schizophrenia, undermines sense of humor. It makes people mm. kind of less funny. It might make them weirder, but not mm. able to do engaged humor as well. So humor also is kind of a testimony to mental health, happiness, um, emotional stability, et cetera. 
so we're always trying to unpack what's the underlying logic behind why certain things are are attractive. Yeah, that's actually interesting. I've never I never thought of that point you just made of it being a potential mental health indicator because you're you're absolutely right that this the sense of humor aspect is something that does go when when people have that as well as the um you know, I think we're living in an interesting time actually in our society and culture where I mean we're we're, we're literally talking as not one but two comedians not so long ago have been attacked on stage for telling a joke. And I've noticed over the past many years that a lot of people seem to be losing their sense of humor. And it's, you know, sometimes it's looked through this, this political lens, but it's like, what, what's going on here? Why are people not able to take a joke? Why is everyone, why are people taking more offense over very sort of minor, minor things that, you know, are not, are not really that gratuitous or horribly offensive or anything like that. Um, so it, it's it's an interesting thing to note because that seems to play on some way, on both an individual level but also like a societal level. I, I feel I feel like societies become a bit more uh, stuck it's up like, and fragile. Stuck up and fragile in a way. Yeah, kind of puritanical. Puritans yes. don't like humor. Yes, and so. It's almost like there's a trade-off between being super earnest and serious about everything in life mm -hmm. versus being very playful and not taking anything seriously. Mm -hmm. And I think if you you want to be in good relationships that are that are productive, like with you know a spouse or in a serious relationship or even a friendship that you value, you have to be able to kind of go back and forth along that spectrum from earnest to, to humorous. So like my wife, Diane, and I make fun of each other a lot, but in we try to be sensitive to like the context of when we're doing it. Mm -hmm. And we also try to make fun of uh, ourselves as much as of the other person. Yes. One thing that you see about wokeness is an almost total inability to do healthy self-mockery, <laughs> right? No. To make fun of themselves. So I respect some people who are kind of, you know, progressive liberals, if they have a sense of humor about it and they kind of have a, an understanding of how this can become quite ridiculous and, yes. and bizarre. And like, they don't take it too seriously. Mm. And I, th I think we are kind of um, in danger of losing that in, in public discourse, particularly social media, as you and I both know, yeah. right? A lot of people will take a joke and then give it the most puritanical judgmental interpretation they can mm -hmm. and and you know come after you for it yeah it's it's almost like the the principle of uncharity right yeah. taking everything in the worst way possible rather than giving people the benefit of the doubt and saying okay maybe okay yeah maybe that crossed the line a little but they probably meant it this way it's like someone can just say something very benign and someone will go out of their way to twist and convolute it into them being or you know potentially meaning something that they absolutely didn't and maybe i'm just more privy to it now with the rise of social media and my own profile but it i don't feel like people used to do that so much i think people used to give each other the benefit the benefit of the doubt more um and kind of be more willing to laugh things off and you know forgive people when they did maybe cross a line but yeah, as you said it's become very puritanical and with that with that also comes the sort of ag aggression right the the aggression the, the mobs the you know these these attacks whether online or what sometimes trickling into the real world as well and i think you know one one way to fight this might be to kind of encourage more people to actually do like take an improv comedy class, do a mm. little stand up at an open mic locally and figure out just how difficult it is to make people laugh without being a little transgressive. Yeah. My theory is a lot of the woke folks don't actually do enough in-person social interaction that's funny mm. that they actually have the experience of understanding from the inside, you know, what it takes to actually be funny and and deliver joy and laughter to other people. Mm. 
because if basically they're spending all the time, you know, on their phones in front of their computers, not interacting socially, just texting people, they're not really developing their kind of comedic skills or their, they're not getting like well calibrated about how do you actually do human social life in a mm. way that is light and playful and, and funny. I think if they leveled up those skills, you know, they'd have a lot more tolerance for like uh, Joe Rogan or um, other stand-up comedians, you know, violating social norms. They wouldn't take mm-hmm. those violations that seriously. They go, oh yeah, like I do that all the time in my own relationships, not a big deal. Mm-hmm. I think something else that's that's also interesting is I've observed that Maybe I can maybe that maybe this isn't a new thing. I don't think this is really a new thing. I think we're just experiencing it in its latest form. And this is the inability of people to separate themselves from their ideas or their beliefs in any way, shape, or form. So if someone's belief or is 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 questioned or is challenged or whatever, there's this I and I I understand the the urge, right? We all we all have things that are, you know very, very close to us and things that we, that we hold deeply. Um, but if that is even just approached or prodded in a, in a way that, that people don't like, then there's this huge, you know, backlash and aggression. And I think actually it's important. And I think it's an ongoing activity to be able to separate yourself somewhat from your beliefs so that if someone questions or challenges that, Yes, that might be a deeply held belief of yours, but it's not a it's not an attack on the individual. Um, it's not like you're, you're not you're not going after the person, right? So I don't like I'm I'm a Christian, right? I'm a, I believe I believe in God. I know many people who don't. There's all sorts of different religions out there, but if someone says something about you know made a fair comment or criticism or you know asked a question about Christianity, I won't blow my lid on them as if like they directly are trying to attack me or offend me or whatever. It's like, but, but I think it takes a, I think you kind of have to practice that to go, okay, wait, that's interesting. Why, why do you think that? Or cool. Like, let's, let's, let's have this, let's have this discussion. Okay. I see your perspective. This is my perspective and share that. Um, And then I think it gets even harder online because of course you, you can't say anything. (laughs) Yeah. You, you, You can't say anything without potentially, uh, you know, and the bigger, the bigger, there's a problem I, I've been experiencing over time is like the bigger the audience, the, the, the less likely, I, I don't think I've ever had a viral tweet, which hasn't like offended somebody where I'm, <laughs> that's, uh, I just like, that, that wasn't my goal. I'm just here, like thinking out loud, putting my thoughts out there, agree, disagree, you know? Yeah. I, you know, I think, look, any, anybody who's active on social media, who has a substantial following, like whatever, 10,000, 20,000 followers, whatever. You have way more followers than I do, but you know, I have my little audience. Anybody who's in that position knows your persona in social media is not your your real life persona. Like mm-hmm. I know Zuby on Twitter is, is not the same as, you know, Zuby in, in your private life. My and I deliberately chose like pretty, pretty similar, poly. pretty yeah. <laughs> more, more, more. Uh, there's more ability for nuance in in the right. real world, right? There's more ability for nuance. And that's not to say it's inauthentic. It's just a different facet of of mm-hmm. ourselves that we project on social media. Just like when I give a talk at a scientific conference, that's a particular persona that mm-hmm. I adopt. That's like more formal, more measured, more more aspie, whatever. Yeah. Um, And it's really important for people to be able to separate the social media personas from, you know, the real life people. And to remember, there's a real life person behind that. Um, Just like, you know, back in the 70s, everybody understood, like David Bowie is going to adopt a different stage persona, like for every concert tour. Mm -hmm. And it's not like the real David Bowie. Um, There was an understanding that, like, this is partly... uh, performative and yet it can be in a way more authentic <laughs> on social media when you're saying what you you really think than perhaps you yeah. might say in your private life to, to friends and family 
Yeah. I, I think a big problem with social media as well, beyond just the the noise and the amount of information and the speed of it is that, and I think this happens on Twitter especially, and I think I've made this point on previous, start with a hot topic or the latest political controversy or throwing out your you know religious convictions or thoughts on this or that, right? You start always with common ground, right? You start with an introduction, you build some common ground, you build some rapport, you establish that you're both decent human beings. And then maybe if you talk for a long time, you might get into some more interesting topics. But on Twitter, this happens in reverse. So the first time someone comes across Jeffrey Miller, the first time someone comes comes across Zuby, it's quite probable <laughs> that, that that it's something that we said, which was, you know, a bit a bit edgy or controversial or going against the narrative or something. And so people then very quickly form this caricature of who they think you are, everything about you, your story. Oh, if he believes this, he must also believe all of these other things and and whatever. And sometimes, you know, sometimes they might be accurate, but most of the time they're they're really far off. So people have this image of who you are. Um, also, there's no there's no facial expressions, there's no tone, there's no anything. And so w with this disembodiment and the conversation starting already at some kind of tension, I think it's just very easy for people to just end up screaming at each other. And like there, there's met so many people on Twitter or on social media in general where I think, hmm, I think if I met this person in the in the in the real world, we'd probably get on. Right. Like yeah, we'd, at totally. we'd at least be civil at, at a minimum, but just because of the way this has happened and the way we've kind of discovered each other, you're almost at this, at this impasse. And then of course you have an audience looking on. And so no one wants to, people don't like changing their mind publicly or someone doesn't want to concede anything or whatever. And it just ends up in this, in this type of fight. And I don't think it's very conducive to much. Yeah, we, my wife and I had the interesting experience back in January of going to this conference called Hereticon. And Hereticon was at Faina Hotel in Miami. And basically, it was a, a few hundred people from kind of like intellectual dark web and alternative centrists and different kinds of like heterodox thinkers. Mm -hmm. Most of us knew each other through Twitter okay. and hadn't met in person before. And so you're hanging out in, you know, Faina Hotel Bar and meeting all these people where you you know them and you've actually like DM'd with them, you've retweeted them, you've interacted on social media a lot, but you've never met them in person. Mm. And there was a kind of awkwardness where like you kind of know a lot about a certain limited part of their persona. Um, and you know almost nothing <laughs> about their tone of voice, how they actually interact everything else they're interested in. And you kind of have to build the relationship up uh, from scratch. So I think it's it's a good insight that, you know, we we kind of start backwards on Twitter from the the stuff that normally it would take you several hours of hanging yes. out to get to. And um, I don't know, maybe in the future, there'll be some kind of uh, form of social media Mm -hmm. in the metaverse god forbid or whatever <laughs> that maybe allows a more natural style of um interaction yeah yeah it's something that's possible it's just that it's it's difficult it's difficult um because we all have our biases we all have our prejudices in all sorts of directions even even those of us who try not to it's just something that humans have because you'll you'll see it you'll see the comment what do you do next you go you look at the bio have a quick look at the bio it's like mm, okay i see this and that so boom you put them in this box and um i mean hey i do this i mean there's a law called uh you know zuby's razor which i've said you know if someone has their pronouns in the bio then um <laughs> and, and i genuinely i genuinely try i i'm i'm often i think i've had like three people who have disproved this mm -hmm. um over probably a three-year period um, cause I, I don't want to jump to such conclusions, but it's like, you end up creating heuristics. Um, but then someone else might see, oh, you know, like an American flag and hashtag MAGA and someone else's pro. And they're like, oh mm -hmm. gosh, okay. This is, this is this person. This is that person. But again, if they met in real life, it would just be like, oh, Hey, nice to meet you. What's your name? Okay, cool. I'm from here. You're from there. So on and so forth. And you know, that pronouns in the bio person and that MAGA America flag person could actually, you know, get on and just have a decent conversation and they wouldn't 
you know they, they wouldn't be screaming at each other and thinking thinking one another are are evil or racist or whatever other thing whatever ism and phobia they want to put out there yeah i think we've kind of lost the art of of feeling like there's a kind of civic obligation to be able to get along with people of different mm. political views. And like my parents were very active in local politics in Cincinnati, Ohio, and they were involved in all kinds of groups, you know, local planning boards or school boards or like League, League of Women Voters, where there was a real diversity of political views among the people actively engaged and where mm. you're, you're in neighborhoods where people actually talk to their neighbors and the kids play together and there's genuine um, community. Yes. And so everybody felt like we have a kind of moral obligation to be able to get along with people who vote differently from us and think different things. And, you know, maybe we're all going to the same church every Sunday and we know we don't agree about things, but we have to get along. Hmm. And I think that kind of civic virtue of feeling like, Everybody has individual responsibility to at least be able to see the other side's point mm -hmm. of view. We're, we're kind of losing that. And that's, it's kind of tragic because it means you don't really end up with any real civil society. You don't have a, a community once you lose that. Yeah. As an evolutionary psychologist, what are your thoughts on this sort of I guess you could call it this this new challenge in just scaling and quantity. I mean, the notion that we are able to connect with and reach on a daily basis hundreds of thousands or millions of people, as far as human history goes, I mean, that's never existed before unless you were unless you were a king. Or, or a queen and even then it was it was localized in your geographic area but having this ability to from your smartphone or from your laptop through social media through youtube through podcasts and so on just to reach and connect with vast amounts of people all over the world as much as i love that and it's amazing and i've built my career off it it also freaks me out because i'm just like this is so unnatural and there is no there's no blueprint for how this is supposed to work. This is just a complete experiment. I'm not meant to be connected to over a million people. Like that's not normal. It's cool. <laughs> it's cool, but it's 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 not normal. Um so it's completely surreal. Yeah, it's yeah. it's basically impossible for a kind of ordinary social primate brain like ours, right? Where we've evolved to most spend most of our time in little clans of like 20 or 30 people that are kind mm -hmm. of like extended family and our mates and and kind of in-laws and a bunch of kids. And maybe that exists within the context of a bigger um, tribe, which is a kind of bunch of clans, maybe up to a thousand, two thousand people, mm -hmm. right? Kind of speak in the same dialect and once in a while getting together for parties or rituals or whatever. But the scale of modern society is is you know, orders of magnitude bigger than that, that it's vast in scale. And yet, and yet we're trying to deal with it, with this very tribal uh, brain. And it is surreal. If you do public performances that are, you know, streaming to hundreds of thousands, millions of people, you have to develop these little tricks for how to, how to deal with it. Like when I'm writing a book, I basically have like, the one ideal reader in mind. Mm -hmm. I can't think about thousands of readers. There's like the one ideal reader who I hope will read it and I'm writing for that one person. And likewise, you know, I think one reason these kind of podcast um, talks work is that I sort of have the illusion I'm just talking to Zuby and you're yes. just talking to me. And then the fact that there's maybe thousands of, of people who will later eavesdrop on it um, isn't really that salient, mm -hmm. right? And it lets us be relatively natural. But man, if I was like up on stage, like Billie Eilish doing a live performance to 100,000 <laughs> people in a Coliseum, huge respect for the people who can do that because I would find that just absolutely trippy and, yeah. and bizarre. Do you, know, do you know what's interesting, actually, um, as, a, as a performer um, is... Performing to smaller crowds 
is it, it, it triggers more the, uh, the that kind of nervous energy mm -hmm. than if you're doing a, a, a larger performance. I've performed at a few festivals and stuff like that. Now, never to 100,000 people, but certainly to thousands of people. And it's harder to do a performance to like 20 or 30 people in a room than to even two, two or 3,000 in my yeah. experience because there's a number where you don't really see individuals anymore right like if it, if there's yeah. 20 people you can see each person's face and how they're responding to each song and you know you can you can talk to you can make eye contact with each individual and it feels a lot sort of sort of closer but actually once it gets past a certain level it feels like you're it, it feels more one to one in a way it kind of it, re it reverts back to that one to one feeling where it's like oh it doesn't matter how many people are out there now it's just a crowd so I'm just going to do this. I can't look into everyone's eyes. I can't really see everyone's reaction. Who's paying attention? Who's getting bored? If there's 20 people, I can tell if one person's not enjoying the show, right? Like I can see how oh, that person is getting bored or he's starting to talk to, he's talking to that person over there. And it actually distracts you as a performer because you're like, you, you, do, <laughs> you start seeing oh, people totally. like doing all that. But actually, if it's tons, you, you, you don't notice anything. Yeah, I think every academic has this. Like, we actually find it way easier to do a, a large class, like lecturing to 100, okay. 200 students, than to do a small seminar where it's like 10 to 20 students mm. and where you can see all their reactions. And you're much more acutely self conscious if you've got, you know, a 10 student seminar than um, a much bigger uh, performance. Um, so I'm I'm kind of introverted and I'm not naturally like socially confident, outgoing. And that's true of a lot of professors. Like we're the introverted nerds, but then in graduate school, you have to learn how to teach to, to big classes. Most of us can learn to do it pretty well, but we still feel like small seminars are a little bit uh, socially awkward because you've got that kind of one-to-one -one eye contact and you can read people's expressions and you can see when they're bored. If you're, you know, lecturing to um, a large class or you're doing like stand-up comedy for thousands of people, then you can just kind of blur everybody out and take like the average energy of the room and kind of feed on that without having um, to kind of monitor individual reactions to what you're doing. Mm, I hear that. Switching topics a little bit, Jeffrey. Um, I saw some of the questions that people had put to you on Twitter. So instead of uh, going through each of them one by one, I saw a lot of questions just about the challenges and some of the questions and concerns around men and women in mm -hmm. society today, especially young men and young women. It seems like there's a lot of confusion, a lot of uh, loneliness. There's various mental health issues that are popping up. And I also think that just in terms of people knowing their place and knowing their roles, perhaps we're at an all time low of that not really being clear for a lot of young people. So can you share some of your thoughts on that? What do you think are some of the big challenges that men and women and people together are facing in this regard? I think this is this has been a big issue for years and years. I mean, the, the challenge of men and women finding each other and having good relationships is what mm -hmm. you know inspired Tucker Max and I to write the Mate book in 2015, and that was intended as sort of dating, dating advice to young single straight guys about how to level up, how to improve their attractiveness to women, and not just physical attractiveness, but also like how do you cultivate your social skills and your sense mm -hmm. of humor and your sense of style and your career and your um, your dating skills. And we were kind of playing against the previous pickup artist approach, which is basically let's develop like sociopathic manipulative tactics that kind of hit women's hot buttons and try to get them into bed as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. When we ran the Mating Grounds podcast that was associated with that, that book project, we had hundreds of young men calling in with questions. Very, very few of them wanted to just like maximize notches on the belt or maximize the number of women they'd slept with. The typical young guy just wants a girlfriend. 
just like any girlfriend, anybody who's pretty good, who they mm. can hang out with and play video games with and have sex with and have some, uh, some validation with, that's what they want. And they have no idea how to get it. Um, it seems like their parents failed to educate them in sort of <clears throat> how male and female psychology works. Public schools had failed them. Right. We have sex education, but we don't have like relationship education or courtship mm. education. Um, you know, mass media had sort of failed them because you don't actually learn how to have a successful date just by watching romantic comedies. Um, or by watching typical long form dramatic TV series. Why? Mm. Because <laughs> screenwriters are lazy. And they create all kinds of artificial conflict within couples. And that's a terrible role model for young people, right? If you think you should behave in a relationship the way that most people in marriages, in movies behave, you'll have an awful lot of pointless, stupid arguments about trivia. <laughs> and so we think it's kind of a failure of education. Um, but what's happened now is with... Tinder and dating apps, a lot of people see or think they're seeing other people having way more sexual success than they are, or they see other people having what they think are great relationships, right, that are being glamorized on Instagram. And they're not actually getting very many reality checks about how these things actually unfold and, mm -hmm. and what you can do in, in real life to kind of be more attractive, have better relationships, understand the other sex better. Yeah, I hear that. I think also, I think a big problem that we're, we actually have in society is just one of, it, it's weird because it, it seems like simultaneously we have problems of uh, both both scarcity and abundance. And perhaps they're, those things are not as opposite as it might seem. I, I, I feel this way, everything from, from relationships to food um to just just a lot of sort of social behavior it's almost like things have been so materially good for a while i mean if if you're a young person who's i don't know probably 40 and under we we haven't really you know it's been very very peaceful um, there haven't been the massive sort of global struggles that humans of the past would have constantly been dealing with. We haven't had major world wars or anything like that, where tons of young men have been shipped off to fight in battle, or we've, you know, facing some type of famine or, I mean, yes, we, we had this, uh, you know, pandemic for two years, but if we're being honest, it was, it was very, very mild compared to, uh, many of the things that humans have dealt with in the past. And, it seems like with that sort of material success and lack of threat, um, coupled with this rise of technology and smartphones and social media and interconnectedness and all of these apps and everything, it's like we have so much, but I think it's made people feel like they they have little or they don't know what to do. They, they, there's, there, there's too much out there. There's so much that they don't know. They don't know what to choose. They don't know what to do. They don't know their role. They don't know where they fit in. And then it looks like, as you said, it looks like you can see everybody else's life or the highlight reel of their life. And it looks like, oh, well, this person has that. And this girl looks like that. And that guy has that. And, you know, it makes people feel, I think, especially this, this hits teens and perhaps people in their early twenties. Um, and it's interesting. Cause I mean, I'm, I'm 35. So it's funny to think that I'm really part of the that last generation that's had grown up with both without the internet and all the social media and also with it, with someone who's even just 10 years younger than me, who's 25. I'm like, man, you, 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 that's always been there. Like you, when Facebook started, you were just a child and then, you know, you, yep. you haven't known the world without all of this stuff. So I think that's also a, a big shift that sort of happened in humanity that people haven't necessarily thought much about. Yeah. I, I imagine that one, one big challenge that young people face is that they're exposed to video games and TV and um, all kinds of entertainment media that are vastly better than anything ever before in history. Mm -hmm. Right? Like recent Avengers movies are just better movies than 
any shit from the 20th century, to be honest. <laughs> um, political Twitter is more interesting than almost any newspaper would have been like 20 or or 50 years ago. Mm. I kind of had the, the good fortune to grow up, you know, as a teenager, like in the 80s, where talking to intelligent young women was far more interesting than any of the broadcast television that was available. Mm -hmm. There were no very compelling video games. Girls were the most interesting thing in the world, literally, like yeah. cognitively. And that's the way it's been for 99% of human evolution, right? The people around you were the key sources of education and inspiration and, and entertainment. Mm. And now you have a global entertainment system that means like going on a date and actually paying attention to the person across the table from you. <laughs> like, is it even, does it even make the top 10 list of the most interesting ways you could spend two hours? For a lot of people, I think not. And I worry that this leads people to have these kind of unrealistic expectations about like what a real life relationship would look like. Mm. And we know from the data on people like not having as much sex as they did in the 80s and not being in relationships and not living with people until they're in their 30s or 40s, if ever, that people are basically treating intimate sexual relationships as like optional rather than a foundation of, of like a shared life with someone. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that's so interesting. And just the other day, I mean, I've known about this for years, but the other day I was looking into, uh, so I think, I think in the, I think in the entire world, I think it's Japan that has the lowest, lowest yep. birth rate. Like their population is plummeting. Mm -hmm. And I was actually just reading a, a couple articles online about this phenomenon. And it's interesting because that is also one of the most technologically advanced countries in the world. And you see that as that technology has progressed and certain things have shifted that, I mean, I'm sure you've heard the term herbivore men, which they, you know, assign to these men who are just not even, it's not really interested in women. They've just kind of, they've just kind of checked out. They, you know, maybe have their career and they play their video games and do their hobby and whatever. But, you know, everyone's just isolated. Some of them will pay a lot of money just to, just to talk to a woman because they're so socially awkward and they feel so isolated. And, um, you know, I, I do have concerns that things across the developed world are trending in that direction. And then you've got uh, concepts like you touched on it before, you know, the metaverse, which, um, again, from, from a technological standpoint is interesting. But if you see the way some people are so hardcore addicted to their smartphones already, I mean, you have to, how many couples have you seen out, out on dates in restaurants, not even talking to each other, just sitting there on their phones? Um, and I'm just like, man, what about having this toolkit where someone can just sit, sit at home and basically be a different person in a different reality, living in a different world, not just video games, not just social media, but that multiplied by virtual reality. And I'm like, man, that's, um, th that's, it's, it's that's super worrying in a way. I mean, I think extremely good, compelling virtual reality entertainment is is in a way an existential threat to humanity, mm -hmm. because if it leads people to allocate a lot more time and money and energy to sort of just interacting virtually um, with like the most interesting people in the world that you can find rather than living with them and making babies with them, right, then mm -hmm. humanity goes extinct pretty quick pretty quick like it, yeah. it it is in a kind of slow motion extinction event in japan and in a lot of um europe like particularly mm. spain and italy for some reason have incredibly yeah. low fertility rates um so i think unless we confront this as a civilization and think yeah how are we actually going to weave in like serious long-term sexual relationships and having kids and raising them and having families with this amazing technology um, you know, we're done for. And I feel it in my own life. I've got this beautiful, amazing two month old daughter. Mm. And I find myself like messing around on Twitter when I should be, you know, like paying attention to her <laughs> and playing with her. And she gives me these looks sometimes like, what the hell's wrong with you? Like, 
I'm the vessel of your genes. I am your path to like immortality mm-hmm. and and descendants and future generations. And here you are messing around with this this virtual um, environment, social media. So I I get it. I feel that pull. Mm. But I think if we can, you know, help each other uh, kind of resist that temptation and stay based, stay grounded, stay focused on family, pronatalism, babies, Mm -hmm. create the next generation. If we, you know, if we fail, then humanity fails. Yeah. I I mean, I, it's so interesting. I I know that, um, it's, it's good to, to talk to someone who, (laughs) who, who shares that perspective because there are also a lot of people, especially in the West who are, you know, for all intents and purpose, anti-natalist and they, you know, will stick by the notion that the world is overpopulated and that the best thing you can do for climate change is to not have children or to have fewer children. And that, you know, there's just too many people on the planet and this is some great existential threat, which I think, you know, you, you, you know, that I, I'm, uh, I'm no fan of that narrative nor believer in it. Um, but it does seem to have gained a lot of ground and be implanted in a lot of people's brains, whether or not they, whether or not they sort of explicitly recognize it. I think over the past few decades, it's kind of been programmed into a lot of the, 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 the media and the culture for people to think that having children or certainly having a lot of children is this kind of, you know, selfish thing that's harming the planet and, you know, it's bad for the climate and, you know, or that there's, it's going to lead to some type of chaos or we're going to run out of fresh water or we're going to run out of this and all of that. I mean, I think all of this has been debunked by people who truly study this, but um, I, I think it's still quite a pervasive and powerful narrative. Yeah, it's really powerful. And it, in a way, it is it is the heart of wokeness. The, the thing mm-hmm. that really pisses me off about wokeness, it's, it's not the hostility to free speech. It's not the bizarre gender politics. It's not the anti-science. It's, it's the anti-natalism. Mm-hmm. It's the justifying, hey, you're, the message that you're more virtuous if you live by yourself and play your video games and have the minimal impact on the planet than if you actually make the next generation of people. Mm. And that to me is, it's anti-human. It's actually incredibly selfish. And it's just a rationalization for um, laziness and and a kind of solipsism that says, as long as I'm not like using too many resources, I'm better than you guys, you Mormons, you Baptists, whatever, who are having a bunch of kids. Um, well, that's fine. Take that view, but guess what? In a hundred generations, it's going to be, you know, the fundamentalist, uh, Christians and Muslims who will dominate the future, Mm -hmm. right? The people who show up, the people who have kids, that's the future. So you either play that game, um, or you opt out, but I think it's important for, you know, the woke to realize Wokeness won't last more than two or three generations if they don't actually have kids. Yeah. Do you think that in places like Japan and certain European countries, what sort of risk do you see there of a genuine population collapse? Because I think it's it's very hard for the human brain to think about anything that's got an exponential component. So I think people imagine, oh, okay, that's fine because it's just like a, a linear decline, but it's not because if one generation doesn't, you know, sustain, doesn't sustain its numbers, then there's, there's fewer people in the next one and it can actually decline very, very precipitously. Um, and I don't think people, number one, recognize that just as a kind of mathematical function, but also think about, okay, well, what sort of impact would that have on a society if you know there are millions fewer people millions less people than there there were previously um in a country such as that then what what does that mean for what what does that mean for the country yeah i i have very mixed feelings about this because on the one hand there's a part of me that kind of assumes like oh lifespans will continue to be about as long as they do and on that assumption 
you know, if Japan uh, is only having like one child per woman, the population drops by half every mm -hmm. single generation until pretty soon no more Japanese. On the other hand, there's a part of me very interested in regenerative medicine and longevity and new biomedical breakthroughs that mm -hmm. maybe could help extend not just human lifespan, but, but um, you know, what David Sinclair at Harvard calls health span, like the number of decades you're healthy and active and mm -hmm. you can potentially work. So if you have like an aging population, but everybody is still, you know, healthy and capable and strong and able to function at age 100 or 150, then it doesn't matter as much how many kids they're having, right? Because you can sustain the population longer. So I feel this, this kind of dichotomy where like part of me is hoping for the longevity treatments. Mm -hmm. Like I don't want to die. I would prefer to live another 100 years. I'd prefer to see my daughter's <laughs> great-great-grandchildren if possible. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, part of me knows like that might not happen. It might not happen for a while. And to hedge our bets, it's probably good to like keep having kids. Yes. What's it been like for you? Um, is, is this your, is your daughter your first child? No, I've got a 25 year old daughter. Oh, okay. I, I've, okay. I've smeared my reproductive okay. out <laughs> okay, okay. over many decades. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I was what? with the new baby. I was like, oh man, I haven't changed a diaper since the nineties. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'm not going to say, I'll, I'll, cause I was like, wait, I'll, I was, cause initially I was about to say, new father and i was like wait i don't know I, I don't think i don't think this is your first child um but what's it like having having to deal with a, a a newborn um again at this stage in the game it's it's fine it's um she's delightful she's very well behaved um my wife is very very savvy about training baby getting baby on a schedule making <laughs> the parenting process as easy as possible i think a lot of um Americans, Brits, Europeans take this incredibly stupid approach to parenting that is like, we'll just do whatever the baby seems to want. Um, we'll be slaves to baby's uh, desire. We won't read anything about how to actually get them on a schedule and train them and, and help them flourish in a way that fits with our lives, right? They become like full-time parents mm -hmm. in a very inefficient way that doesn't actually make them or the or the baby happy. Um, also, when I sort of announced on Twitter, oh, I've got a baby, a lot of people are like, oh, man, you're too old. How can you possibly think about having a baby in your 50s? Uh, the optimal time is, you know, in your 20s when you've got energy. I thought, honestly, I have about as much energy now as I did in my <laughs> 20s. Like, I try to stay in pretty good shape, yeah. you know. I don't work out as much as you do, but, you know, I try to stay healthy and the rate of decline in physical capability and energy level is not that steep mm -hmm. if you make a little effort to stay healthy. Yes. So I think a lot of people have a little more time uh, than they might think, but that's depends on whether you're a guy or, or a woman, right? Of course. Um, a lot of women seem to think that they, they can like wait until 40 to find a guy and then start trying to have kids and like hope for the best and it'll be mm -hmm. fine. They're often quite disappointed. So um, like my wife and I often talk with women about like planning the reproductive careers yes. and how important it is to really seriously think ahead about that. Like, uh, you know, you can get your antimalarial hormone, AMH hormone level checked. And that's a pretty good predictor of like, how long until menopause? How long do you have if you're a woman uh, in terms of staying fertile? Mm -hmm. And a lot of women, even smart women in academia, like in their late 20s, early 30s, have no idea what their AMH level yep. is. Yep. Never checked it. They, they don't even know when their own mothers reached menopause. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to plan like a career and a potential family without really knowing realistically uh, you know how many more years do they have yeah well man that leads on to a, you know a, a general topic which is that 
you know, we, I think we live, we, we really live in an age where it's been implicitly determined that subjective opinions and people's emotions are, should supersede and trump objective facts and biological realities. Um, and I think one thing that's quite deranging about the time that we live in is there's three narratives all going on at once, and you're supposed to believe all of them. Number one is that, well, there's more than three, but on this topic, you're supposed to believe that men are, you know, men and women are the same, <laughs> and also that they're different, and also that they're interchangeable, or that they're social constructs, and that they don't really exist. And you're supposed to, when, depending on the scenario, you're supposed to kind of believe each of those ones at different times, right? You're supposed to acknowledge that men and women are are the same and totally equal, you know, from physically and mentally in terms of their interests, in terms of their biology, in terms of, you know, the reproductive age, all of this stuff. That's kind of the politically correct position in that way. But then with other things, you're supposed to acknowledge that, oh, actually, you no, know, men are men are these oppressors and women are victors and, you know, there's the patriarchy and, you know, there's this delineation and it's very clear and women have these very special struggles and need these different pr protections and so on as a protected class. And then there's the entire gender ideology thing, which is like, oh, you know, what is a woman? You know, oh, a woman is anyone who identifies as a woman. You know, you can have a beard and a penis and you can be a woman and whatever. And so I think it's all quite deranging. And I think it leads to a lot of people, like you said, even, even smart people not recognizing just some just some realities. I mean, I, I did not create biology. I didn't invent the way reproduction happens and whatever, but there are certain things that are, you know, I understand they're uncomfortable for, for people or, you know, you don't really want to acknowledge certain things, but some things it's just like, Hey, this is just reality. And actually I would say that you, you someone is doing a, I think a, a society is doing women a terrible disservice if the general message is that, yeah, it's totally fine to, you know, wait until your forties to, you know, find a man and start a family. And like, that's totally fine. Oh, you know, that, that so-and-so celebrity had just had a baby at 48. So you'll be fine too. Yeah. And I'm like, yo, that, that's a, that's a reckless, that's a reckless message. It might make people feel good, but you know, I think that leads to despair for a lot of people. And it's, it's simply not, it's simply not true. It's, it's not, it's not correct. And I didn't invent that. It's just, it's just how it is. And it seems like in the past, people inherently knew this and it was just like, duh, obvious. But uh, now it's like, if you say that out loud, you know, people kind of look at you like you're some misogynist or something. Yeah. And I, you know, I think one of the really toxic um, views that's very common is basically that biology is nothing more than oppression and, and biology is limitation and constraint and that everybody should resent their biology, they should resent their genes, they should resent anything that evolution gave them. Mm -hmm. um, to me, a great thing about evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology, studying all that stuff is the, the huge amount of gratitude that you feel towards like your DNA and your biology. And being able to wake up every morning and go, oh my God, this is amazing. Like my heart beats millions of times in a lifetime without me having to pay any attention to it awesome. Mm. I have this three pound brain that can think all these thoughts and have experiences. And, you know, most of the universe isn't like that. It isn't sentient. It isn't aware. It's, uh, it's just, you know, blank and dull and stupid. And yet a lot of people seem to grow up with the idea that, well, if only it weren't for biology, we would all be like infinitely free and infinitely equal and everything would be awesome if if we didn't have bodies and then we didn't have dna and we didn't have mm. genes and to me that is just so stupid and delusional because um you know the biology is the foundation of everything beautiful and important and valuable and ethical about humans um and now I know in a religious perspective, you know, there's there's a different view you can take on that. But I think even there, um, I'm kind of a fan of John Paul II's uh, theology of the body in, in Catholic doctrine mm -hmm. that says, respect the body because 
if you believe in a divine creator, the creator made it and made it for spiritual and theological reasons that are worth diving into. So I think there's a, a funny kind of overlap between evolutionary biology, gratitude mm -hmm. to the body and to, and to our genes, and even like a, um, a, a Catholic respect for it as sort of a manifestation of like divine providence and, and where you feel grateful to God rather than just grateful to your genes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I see well, a lot of people who reject both of those perspectives and are just mm. like, God, I hate my body. I hate my genes. I hate my parents. I hate my ancestors. Mm. They brought me nothing but, you know, guilt and shame. Yeah. Well, I think two, two big problems that we, we face again in the modern West are number one, lack of gratitude and number two, lack of perspective. I think as a as a modern American or Brit or whatever, you know, it's it's easy to, you know, the truth is that the world is full of posit positive and negative. It's full of light, it's full of darkness, it's full of love and joy and happiness, but sorrow and violence and injustice and it's it's complicated. Um and you know, whether whether you view the glass as half full or half empty you are correct but there does seem to be a relatively recent addiction on focusing on the negative all of the time right just just focusing on the negative focusing on the hopelessness uh kind of getting stuck in this doomsday mentality and and i see this in people uh, across the across the political aisle the doomsday narratives might be might be slightly different um but either way it's kind of like well we're, we're all doomed. The future is going to be worse than the present. Um, and we can't do anything. There's some external, there's some external power, whether it's, it's climate change or it's the globalist elites or whatever. And there's just, you know, we're, we're, we're all going to be screwed kind of thing. And I think that's a, I think that's a, a dangerous notion in itself, but also I think there's this lack of perspective on both a historical and a global level. Um, I, I think one of the biggest problems in the USA is that I don't think most Americans know how good they have it. <laughs> I, think, yep. I think that actually leads to so many problems because the USA is not a perfect country. Um, but I mean, when and where would you, is the place that's so much better than the USA in the 2020s, right? W which other country would you rather be in what what other time period would you be in would you rather be in 1922 18, 1822 1722 yeah. um you know or look here's a world map point out the countries that you'd, you'd you'd prefer to live in so you know um and i don't think people truly recognize that so that that ingrat and it, it leads to the it feeds the ingratitude as well because people are always just stuck on the problems but they never think about the progress that's been made over the last few decades alone. They don't think of just how blessed and lucky and fortunate they are to have all of these things that billions of people in the world do not have, even just basic things like decent functioning roads, proper electricity, running clean water, plumbing, let alone, you know, you go into the, what always blows me in my mind when I go to the US is when I go in the, like a supermarket and I, I look at the, I look at the numbers of different types of milk. Like they have milk from things I didn't know you could get milk yeah. from, right? <laughs> <There's> cashews. Like, <laughs> Cashew milk? <laughs> There's like 60 different types of milk. I'm just like, dude, like you go to most places in the world, you got you got one, maybe two, maybe two different, maybe two different kinds. Um, but you know, people will still find a way to complain about it. Yeah, I think that the, the gratitude point is so important. And th there's a lot of empirical psychology research that says, hey, if you want to be happy in life, it helps a lot mm -hmm. to do some gratitude exercises, write down things you appreciate. End of every day, you know, write down some highlights, things that um, you value. And whether it's sort of like, you know, remembering these things in a kind of format of like prayer, or just in a kind of secular, like, yeah, this is worth remembering and, and feeling grateful about. That's really valuable. Mm -hmm. And most people don't do it. Um, but yeah, if you want to appreciate America, live some other places. You know, I've lived in Britain, Germany, um, 
uh, Australia for different lengths of time. I've traveled mm -hmm. a lot of countries and every country has problems, but um, it's very easy to take first world lifestyles for granted if yes. you've never been anywhere else. Absolutely. Absolutely. Jeffrey, man, there's so much that we can discuss. I definitely want to have you back on the podcast in the future, but I want to uh, keep this around the length of most of my episodes. So where can people find you online and follow you? I have a website, primalpoly.com, that has a lot of information about my books and interviews and all my scientific papers are up there and a lot of great resources. You can follow me on Twitter as Primal Poly. Um, and uh, you can read my books like The Mating Mind, Spent, Mate, Virtue Signaling. Mm -hmm. where, where did the where did the term primal poly come from? What's the source of that? Um, it, well, poly is one of my favorite kind of prefixes because it sort of alludes to a bunch of different things. Polymorphism, which is a term from biology, polygenic, which is like a way of adding up gene effects that, that predict a trait, polyamory, which is kind of a relationship style. Um, and I thought I need a Twitter handle that kind of captures a little bit of a sciencey vibe. And then the primal is just kind of an allusion to the evolutionary uh, okay. background. Got it. So it's not the ideal Twitter handle. It's kind of confusing <laughs> to a lot of people, but it's kind of what I'm stuck with at the moment. Awesome. Jeffrey Miller, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. I appreciate you. My pleasure, Zuby. Take care. You too.